Good morning, everyone. How you doing out there? Beautiful, beautiful. I said good morning, everyone. How you doing out there? Wonderful. That's right. Let me hear you for Dr. King today. Welcome, everyone, to the city of Rockville's annual Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration. My name is Unique Robinson, and I'll be your MC this morning. So I myself, I'm a Baltimore City native, a poet performer uh, for about 20 years of my life, and now the director of the MFA Community Arts Program at Maryland Institute College of Art. And I'm very grateful to be here with you this morning. So uh, let's just give another round of applause for Soul in Motion, who opened the celebration. Truly amazing and inspiring. I was clapping from behind the stage. Uh, so Soul in Motion was founded in 1984 by percussionist and executive director Michael Friend and lead, uh, led by associate director Pam Lassiter. This energetic group has performed all over the Washington, D.C. area and is the premier African drum and dance troupe in the area. This year's theme is Boldly Imagining Our Future. This theme challenges our community to achieve Dr. King's dream through daring ingenuity in our communities. As Dr. King said, we must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do right. Even, after, even as we celebrate Dr. King's legacy, oppressive systems continue to exclude and harm members of our community, including black and indigenous people, people of color, LGBTQ plus individuals, people with disabilities, immigrants, low income individuals and families, and our unhoused neighbors. These injustices are complex and far reaching, creating barriers for people pursuing their dreams. Today's theme invites courage, creativity, and curiosity. What lessons can we bring from the civil rights movement into the advocacy of today? How and why do our institutions continue to fail marginalized communities? How can we bravely and effectively reimagine our communities and our world to ensure a just and equitable society for everyone? As we enjoy today's celebration, let us not forget the work ahead of us to continue the legacy and mission of Dr. King. And at this moment, I'd just like to take just a brief moment of silence for Dr. King and all of the wonderful and many ancestors whose shoulders we stand on in this moment. Thank you. So uh, with that said, our next performer, are you ready for your next performer? Let me hear you say yes. yes. Beautiful, beautiful. Our next performer is A.C. Abercrombie. A.C. is a singer, songwriter, voice teacher, and DJ from Columbia, Maryland. She fell in love with singing at the age of two and at age nine began performing in church, school functions, and karaoke until her voice granted her admission into the prestigious Berkeley College of Music. That is amazing. Yes, 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 shouts out. She has since become a professional DJ, performed in several queer events, including Baltimore Pride, and released her debut music project, Worth the Ride, which is currently available on all music streaming platforms. Really wonderful project. Please check it out. By day, AC is pursuing an associate's degree in audio, visual, and music production, and working as a continuing education administrative assistant at Howard Community College. As she progresses in her artistic journey, she hopes to use her voice to shed light on social political issues, such as race and sex sexuality, and is excited to be part of such an honorable event that shares the goal of inclusivity and equity for marginalized groups. So let's give a warm welcome to A.C. Abercrombie. Thank you. <laughs> How's everyone today? Excellent. Listen to the song here in my heart, a melody I start. But can't complete Listen To the sound from deep within It's only beginning To find release Oh, the time has come And my dreams will be heard They will not be pushed aside or turned Into your own you won't listen. Listen, I am alone at a crossroads. 
someone here inside Someone I thought had died so long ago Oh, I'm screaming out and my dreams will be heard They will not be pushed aside or turned into your own All cause you won't listen One more time for AC Abercrombie. Was that not incredible? Amazing, amazing. Thank you for setting the tone. So, today's celebration is hosted in partnership with the city's Human Rights Commission. And I'd like to welcome the Human Rights Commission co-chairs, Andrew Lynn and Amina Shafi Rogers. Give it up for them. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for the City of Rockville's 51st annual Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration. The City's Human Rights Commission is pleased to present this year's event, which was planned and organized with a lot of work and preparation by ourselves and by the City's special event staff. The HRC is an 11-member commission comprised of individuals from the Rockville community appointed by the mayor and the council. We plan several large events each year, including this, this event today, as well as the annual Pride event. Uh, we also run programs focused on student and youth leadership and work with the city on special products, including voter registration drives and community outreach. We'd like to thank the mayor and council, as well as the city staff, including the special events coordinator and our own city liaison, Tyree Davis, for their continued support of our programs. Please join us now in welcoming Rockville Mayor Bridget Donnell Newton. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for joining with us today as we come together to honor and celebrate the vision, the will, and the promise of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I'm Bridget Donald Newton, Mayor of the City of Rockville, and though I cannot see them, I know they're here, I'm joined by Council Members Monique Ashton, Beryl, <laughs> Beryl Feinberg, <laughs> Dr. David Miles, and Mark Prashela. I'm also honored to uh, have with us uh, council member, council mayor as I call him, Sidney Katz, Montgomery County Council Member for District 3, and City Clerk Director of Council Operations, Sarah Taylor Farrell. 
I want to also take this opportunity to introduce Tyree Davis IV, who has joined the city as an advisor to the city manager for JEDI, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Thank you to the members of the Human Rights Commission for all your contributions and for today's celebration. Chairs Amina Shafi Rogers and Andrew Lynn, and committee members Amy Frieder, Gabrielle Zui, Carol Yu Sakabi, Rebecca Murphy, Molly Cullen, Sinan Wolf Gazzo, Peyton Hawkins, and Yasmin Nasser. Let's give them a round, please. <laughs> Welcome to all who have come today to work together for justice and peace. It is an honor to welcome you to Rockville's 51st celebration of Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and legacy. And while Martin Luther King Jr. Day did not become a national holiday in 1986, we are very proud that the city of Rockville has made the decision to celebrate and reflect on Dr. King's legacy for more than half a century. This morning's Washington Post shared the story of 92-year young Lawrence P. Robinson, known to many as Robbie. One of his statements stood out to me, don't get mad, get busy. Growing up in Southern Virginia, he shared a few of the injustices he and his family suffered, including the death of one of their daughters, because though pneumonia was curable, he and his wife were turned away from the hospital because they were black. Told to go to another hospital many miles away, the child died on the way. Don't get mad, get busy. And while we are many decades removed from the civil rights struggles of, I'm sorry, I can't see, of the 20th century upon which Dr. Martin Luther King left his mark, it is frightening to me to see that so many of these struggles continue today. The recent week-long exercise to pick the Speaker of the House and the acceptance of lies and misinformation that feeds those afraid of change must be countered. It's not R&D, it's not liberal and conservative, it's fear versus fact. Don't get mad, people. Get busy. And while we embark on a new year, we must, and a poster Robbie keeps with a photograph and phrases of all the things he wants to remember says, open your arms to change, but don't let go of your values. We must all keep learning, keep moving forward to the light. And as we've seen in recent elections, change is coming. This contingent of newly elected brings together people of all races, ethnicities, religions, and ideologies. They bring energy and passion and have taken up the struggle. The new generation of civil rights activists continue the fight for justice with new voices and new visions for a more equitable, just, and inclusive world. We must understand the importance of reimagining our communities, understand that that means including not just men and women of every color, creed, and religion, but also LGBTQ plus individuals, peoples with disabilities, immigrants, those of different incomes, our unhoused neighbors, and those who live and work differently. It is past time that we endeavor to boldly imagine our future as the theme of today's celebration justly calls us all to do. As we consider, I'm sorry, as consideration of naming the newest MCPS elementary school in Rockville was on the table, a group of community members worked together and suggested Bayard Rustin after the man behind the march on Washington. As an architect of the civil rights movement, Bayard Rustin was an important figure in our nation's history. But as an openly gay black man of his times, he was also marginalized by a culture of racism and homophobia. In naming a public school for him, we are giving Mr. Rustin some of the justly deserved recognition that eluded him during his lifetime. It is our responsibility to strive for a city that leaves no member of our community feeling marginalized. To ensure that this happens, it is our duty to go beyond symbolism. In June of 2020, following the police murder of George Floyd, the mayor and council stood in solidarity with those seeking to end the injustice of racism. We issued a statement that said in part, in Rockville, we celebrate our diversity and we stand for inclusion. We take great pride that the city is safe for all people and that our police, our city staff, and our elected officials do all that they, 
that we can to keep it that way. This requires more than rhetoric. It requires a culture of an inclusion and action to uphold our values. In the years since, I am proud that the city has gone beyond the rhetoric to create a culture of inclusion and action, to uphold our values and support all our neighbors with resources and quality services. To that end, in 2022, the Cindy funded, the city, sorry, funded an advisor to the city manager for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and established a justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion um, position within part of the city manager's office. I encourage you to visit the city's website and search diversity, equity, and inclusion, to learn more about our actions to live up to this pledge, to go beyond the words and uphold our values of inclusion. I also encourage those of us gathered today to make another pledge. Let us pledge to demonstrate courage, creativity, and curiosity as we explore ways to get busy. Let us promise to not only boldly imagine our future, but boldly take the steps necessary to continue to uphold our values and ensure a better future for all. Don't get mad, get busy. Thank you. One more time for Mayor uh, Bridget Donald Newton. Thank you, thank you. So. Y'all still good out there? Wonderful, I love, I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Yes, indeed. So it is with great honor that I introduce to you this year's keynote speaker, Sharon Jackson Wilder, the inaugural Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer from Montgomery College. Sharon has been a nationally recognized scholar, practitioner, and researcher in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space for over 20 years. Before working in higher education, Sharon built diversity programs for private sector firms, served as mayoral appointee in Washington, D.C., and practiced and taught employment, contract, and civil rights law, focusing on disability inclusion. These experiences, together with her local and national speaking and consulting experience, granted her a grounded understanding of the importance of crafting sound policies, practices, project activities, and indicators to address equity, diversity, and inclusion. Wilder's overarching responsibility as CEIO is to advance the college's mission and goals related to diversity, equity, inclusion, civil and human rights, anti-racism, and social justice by creating and implementing programs, policies, and initiatives. Wilder is a graduate of the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where she obtained her Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and African American Studies, and Georgetown University Law School, where she obtained her Juris Doctorate. Wilder also attended George Washington, where she received her certification as a certified public manager, and most recently, the University of Baltimore, where she received her Maryland Equity and Inclusion Leadership Program certification in 2019. Please join me in welcoming Sharon Jackson Wilder. Hello, everyone. Whoa, it's dark out there. How y'all doing? Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today. Thank you to the Mayor and the Human Rights Commission and all of you out there today. I understand I have to talk into the mic, so let me get a little closer. So, you know, as I think about this moment, I know my parents who built their first house in Rockville at Five Duke Court, where I grew up in the 70s, <laughs> would have been so proud to have been here today in attendance. I started College Gardens Elementary School as a kindergartner. And I spent summers in camps at College Gardens Park and Playground and Montgomery College. I was a walker. And every day would walk to school with my friends, Vivian Go and Alyssa Levy. These were my kindergarten playmates who were the first people that I met in our adjoining backyards. I think about opportunity and what it meant to my parents to move to this community where I learned how to ride a bike and fell multiple times on Princeton Place after my dad took off my training wheels. My knees still bear the scars for that. Mm -hmm. 
I think about the swing set in my backyard where we would take turns swinging and climbing the monkey bars and sharing peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and bologna and cheese on white Wonder Bread. And I think about our many play dates that weren't called play dates. When Vivian, Alyssa, and at six years old, my new friend who looked just like me, Stephanie, joined my trio. And they would all come over to my house and listen to Jackson 5 albums on my record player, and I thought it was so cool. And we would go to Vivian's house and eat rice or whatever good stuff Mrs. Go was making that I had never eaten. Or we'd go to Alyssa's, and, and Mrs. Levy would fix potato lockets, which when I told my mom that she really needed to bake them, she said, okay, so hash browns with some applesauce and sour cream instead of ketchup, right? I was born here, I was raised here, and I am so fortunate to have an opportunity to come back to this very community to be the senior administrator at the school I attended summer camp at Montgomery College, and now here in the city of Rockville as today's keynote speaker. <sighs> As you may know from my, note from my bio, I began my career as a civil rights and ethics attorney. And in my current role, I'm the chief equity and inclusion officer at Montgomery College. I had a grandmother who was a college educated teacher. I had a father who not only served his country, but then too attended college and served as a political appointee in the Reagan administration. I have family members, like all of us, who did not have the same opportunities that I had. And within my ever-growing family, I watch my parents provide opportunity after opportunity and serve not only as family role models, but community role models. Together, they brought along others in their journeys to advance or excel or get training or higher education and build businesses and buy homes and build wealth for themselves in the next generation. But when there are no family role models, when there are no friends who pull you along with them and celebrate your success and make you feel like you can even be successful, whatever that means for you, then what? That's when we should have community that steps in. It is critical to support an education system that can step in. And we should have a justice system that can step in. A health care system that steps in. And we should confront these realities in our very community rather than sweep them under the rug. That's where government and community groups should step in confidently aware that being radically inclusive sometimes may mean being intrusive. <laughs> While I was living an idealist, carefree life that my parents provided for me, my brother and sister, in the sheltered and small town environment of college gardens in the post-civil rights era, my parents were experiencing the type of quiet discrimination and shame of being the only parents not invited to the neighborhood parties. Since, of course, we were the only black family in the enclave of newly built homes. But then we joined a church, Clinton African Methodist Episcopal Church, right in Lincoln Park. And that's where we found community. My parents found friends, and we quickly learned that there were actually quite a few black families in Rockville. I reflect on some of those families today. I reflect that at five years old, I could see the difference in housing of black families in Lincoln Park versus the housing on Duke Court. I reflect that at 10 years old, I noticed the difference in furnishings and vacations and trips my family took versus some of the other black families whom we had befriended and that people who seemed to get divorced were black families. I reflect that at 15 years old, when some of the black families died early or had serious health complications, disabling their advancement in their careers and suffered from lack of upward advancement, while some black boys were not talking about going to college that I had been dreaming about going to, 
especially after all of those Howard University homecoming games my parents used to take me to. I remember how when I began taking advanced placement, advanced placement classes, the number of black students in my classes dwindled to just me, or maybe one or two others. I can reflect on the private violin lessons and ballet classes and tennis lessons that were, meant, that, that were meant to be kept to myself because my parents didn't want me to flaunt my outside activities and privilege. I reflect that systemic racism had led to disparities of what broke up the community of Lincoln Park by further isolating it when Metro was built. and where not only a neighborhood was uprooted, but my beloved church suffered too. Reflecting on decades since the civil rights activism of the 20th century, we consider the work before us. As noted in all of the material that you've seen up today, for today, millennials and Gen Z have ushered us into a new era of disruption and activism for racial, economic, social, gender, and disability justice. And the next generation of activists is at the forefront of imagining and creating a more just, equitable, just, and inclusive world. And you will also note that today's theme challenges our community to achieve Dr. King's dream through daring ingenuity in communities. As Dr. King said, we must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always right to do right. And even as we celebrate Dr. King's legacy, oppressive systems continue to exclude and harm members of our community. You know, these injustices are complex and they're far reaching, creating barrier after barrier for people pursuing their dreams. And today's theme involved the consideration of several questions, including one, what lessons can we bring from the civil rights movement into advocacy of today? The Civil Rights Movement is one of the defining events in American history, during which Americans sought to make real the ideals of justice and equality embedded in our founding documents. When students learn about the movement, they learn what it means to achieve and be active American citizens. They learn how to recognize injustice. Having a leader and visionary like Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was crucial to the success of this movement. What we can learn from this advocacy is that the messenger plays a key role in the successful advocacy of any program or change efforts. And we can learn from his movement that sustained effort is critical to legislative and policy change. We can learn that accountability for action and change must be demanded by us and that we cannot waver from questioning systems and rewarding good leadership. We can learn from Stacey Abrams and her local voter registration efforts in Georgia that local change efforts can lead to statewide change. <laughs> there we go. Marginalized communities include those who have been historically excluded from involvement in our cities, as well as those continuing to face other barriers to civic participation. The, this includes, includes those marginalized by factors like race, wealth, immigration status, and sexual orientation. And the specific groups that are disadvantaged will also vary from one community to another, as well, well as the degree to which they face inequality. So what must, must we do? We must disaggregate the problems we see at the local level and tailor our solutions to solve them. And local leaders are obligated to thoroughly understand the landscape of their particular community so that they can respond effectively. And in practice, this means that cultural competency is crucial, as cities must be able to understand and resonate those they serve. That brings us to question two. How and why do our institutions continue to fail marginalized communities? 
While some cities might strive to help marginalized residents, some fail to tailor their efforts to the needs of the marginalized. This can happen because the needs of those who face racial discrimination, for instance, differ significantly from those who are physically disabled. We must also recognize intersectionality. One can be Asian and queer, or Hispanic and learning disabled, or black and hearing impaired, or white and poor, and experience a duality of discrimination. The same holds true for community members who are homeless compared to those who lack technological literacy. And there may be, and often is, overlap between the needs of disparate, marginalized communities, but the unique needs of different groups must also be recognized. Thus, a multi-dimensional approach is often required to effectively and comprehensively engage with disadvantaged community members. As most of you know, in 2020, Montgomery County Council officially declared racism as a public health crisis. That resolution asserted that several Montgomery County Council recently enacted laws and initiatives have identified racism as a root cause of disparities and inequities by race and ethnicity can cause poverty and diminished economic activity. And the resolution further declared that one, race is a social construct with no biological basis that artificially divides people into distinct groups based on characteristics such as physical appearance, ancestral heritage, cultural affiliation, and the social, economic, and political needs of society at a given period. And two, Racism is a social system with multiple dimensions that include individual racism that is internalized or interpersonal, systemic racism that is institutional or structural, and a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks. And three, Racism unfairly disadvantages specific individuals and communities while unfairly giving advantages to other individuals and communities and undermines society as a whole through the waste of human resources necessary to promote prosperity and development in Montgomery County and elsewhere. And four, Racism causes persistent discrimination and disparate outcomes in many areas of life, including housing, education, employment, and criminal justice. And an emerging body of research demonstrates that racism itself is a social determinant for of health. You know, this resolution also further noted that compared to white residents in this county, Black residents experience dramatically higher rates of unemployment, 7.5% to 3.3%, and poverty, 11.2% versus 4%. Dropout of high school, 6.3% versus 2.1%. And further, black residents are twice as likely as their share of county residents to be arrested. 43.9% versus 19.8%. Now that, my friends, is shameful. The resolution further articulated that racism and de facto segregation in our county have exacerbated a health divide, resulting in African Americans having lower levels of health insurance, higher levels of infant and maternal mortality than white residents, and to also die from heart diseases, strokes, and breast cancer. In thinking about best practices in reaching marginalized communities and pockets within these communities, one of the first steps for local governments is to determine which groups are marginalized in their community and why this is the case. And this resolution took a step in that direction. Racial discrimination may be salient in some cities, and while poverty is the main concern in other cities, and the potential intersection is self-evident. To avoid leaving behind those who need to be engaged most, local leaders really need to promote inclusion, listening, and diverse approaches to engagement. Marginalized communities and individuals also tend to uh, share resonance 
with the broader marginalized community they belong to. And these individuals often serve as spokespersons to explain what they've experienced and what changes could help. Giving these groups a seat at the table is a major step in overcoming historic marginalization. But genuinely listening to and considering their ideals is also necessary and even obligatory. The engagement process does not stop with creating space at the table for marginalized communities to share input. What follows is the input collection and analysis is equally as important. And communi community members want to feel that they've been heard and that their input made a difference. It is essential to follow up with community members and communicate that their input was received and is being considered. And if that input leads to action steps that are in line with the feedback, then you should communicate the next steps and thereby exemplifying the impact of engagement. And that brings me to the last question for today. How can we bravely and effectively imagine, reimagine, our communities and our world to ensure a just and equitable society for everyone. Well, imagine black liberation movements without music, trans and queer freedom struggles without pride festivals and dance, immigrant justice movements without posters and murals. Art and culture are not just accessories to organizing, they are indispensable, critical. The blood and fire of our movements, they sustain us and allow us to not only imagine, but to feel the world we are building together. Visual images touch us powerfully and immediately. Many of us here recall the image of fire hoses being trained on peaceful civil rights protesters, or the palatable grief of people of color throughout the world when Do Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, or even still the power, powerful image of watching a man's life being snuffed out in the murder of Mr. George Floyd. Visual images convey our dreams, our rage, our joy in ways that data, print media, and petitions cannot. Visual images let us be witnesses. In frontline and targeted communities, we must communicate and consider how to best communicate our work in visual, spoken, or other forms of artistic expression, expand our movements and cross social divides by uncovering truths, reimagining our stories, and engaging more people. Cultural work may not always result in easily measurable outcomes, but it opens crucial space to dream bigger and envision the world we want to create. COVID-19 has laid bare the inequalities and injustices people face globally. The ongoing collective response to the pandemic must be fair and inclusive of everyone in order to create systemic change. And that means gender equality, racial justice, LGBTQ plus rights, disability rights, and economic justice must all be front and center. Ending racism and extreme poverty won't be possible in a world where people aren't afforded the same rights or treatment by the legal system because of their identity or socioeconomic background. Historians have prioritized whiteness since the founding of this country. White supremacy and colonization are driven by erasure and appropriation of entire cultures as well as erasing the work of individual people of color who were discoverers in innovation, advancement, invention, and development. On this day, as we celebrate the life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we must rededicate ourselves and our work to radical inclusivity, building cultural equity, advancing social justice advocacy, and upholding not only civil rights, but embracing the spirit of civil rights legislation and once and forever decisively fixing systemic racism.
Thank you. Let's give one more round of applause to Sharon Wilder. Thank you, Sharon. We are honored to have you serve as a keynote speaker for this year's celebration. Our next performer is our event MC, Unique Michael Robinson. Unique is a proud Baltimore City native. She received her Master of Fine Arts in English from Mills College in Oakland, California, and a Bachelor of Arts in Creative Writing and Black Studies from Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Since 2016, Unique has been an adjunct faculty member at the Maryland Institute College of Art, or MICA, in humanistic studies, teaching critical theory and creative writing workshops, courses, and co-facilitator of the community gathering series with MICA's diversity, equity, and inclusion director. Unique is the director of MICA's MFA in community arts program, and she has Unique has performed spoken word poetry for over 20 years throughout the United States and Havana, Cuba. Performing a spoken word piece, please welcome Unique Michael Robinson. Hello again. Hi, y'all. So now I'm going to perform a poem. It's called Seven Generations Forward, Seven Generations Back. We have been called to decalcify the clocks of our ancestors. The great, great, great works of hands never celebrated, defined purely by the time of their existence. Jim Crow never flew away, still feasting off missed messages of pigeons, and yet here we are. Skin still as brown, nose, lips, hips still as round. But before I venture to cliches of our isolated body parts handpicked from auction blocks, no, this is not our complete story. Their times of death are not our only reign of glory. I ask myself, what was the purpose of all who came before me? Those who transitioned before thy time perceived. Was it to turn water into blood that which produced us seeds? Was it prayers parked between the seconds they forgot to breathe? As hands worked fields while hands wrapped around necks, both bitten, never bitter, despite mean mugs played cross faces each time our name was reduced to nigger. We are their elixir to turn castor oil to constellation, iron deficiency into alignment with crystalline, the likes of which we have not yet seen, but our great, great, great grandchildren will thank us for, wrestling our every demon back into the earth from which they came, even ones we never claimed, even ones we never named, the ones shoved into potato sacks of shame, ones found in hymnals behind notes of grace, the ones flickering in our eyes and the flame of our uprisings, reasons for exhaust on our faces, the ones we chase off cliffs, the ones we find in boxes under stairs and basements, the ones our ancestors shoved into liver, which later collapsed into blood memory and enigma. And with every casket carried out of double doors, their spirits overlooked the service and whispered, don't celebrate this anymore. Celebrate that which I was born with before we learned what love was not and passed this pattern on to each offspring we left crying in the corner while we prophesied our own way to the corona. No more misalignment, Miss Mammy marching through the mud. If you can't wash the cycles that dissolve us, how could you call this love? Don't pour out no more liquor. We need your elixir. You weren't born into this lifetime just to fill up space with pictures. Do you understand the albums buried in your chest? Ones that can't be contained in room, building, or flesh bigger than our collective minds could conceive. And all we ask is for your open hearts to receive it. And now, it's on you to unlock the next levels. You do our legacy a disservice sitting idle and disheveled. We know this precious life is but a contradiction. Black bodies scattered on blocks needing immediate attention. It's still black matter appearing solid in a physical dimension. So with this in mind, do not replicate evil's form. 
It will be stung, struck, and blown up by an intentional swarm. And when this comes to pass, have not one regret upon the land. Watch the work of your hands be molded into a dance without feet. And at this point, you will join us in our seats. As this life you shed skin for will all but echo in a beat. So don't pour out no more liquor for me. Turn this poison into medicine so we may be free. Thank you. Thank you, Unique, for serving as MC and for sharing that passionate performance with us today. It's an honor to have you here today with us. Now we'll be presenting today's award. First, join me again in welcoming Rockwell's mayor and council to the stage. We'd like to introduce you to Peyton Hawkins and Molly Cullen, Human Rights Commissioners and members of the Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Planning Committee to present the Martin Luther King Jr. Youth Awards. Peyton, Molly. The Martin Luther King Jr. Youth Award is awarded to a high school student who lives or attends a school in Rockville who has helped advance the goals and dreams of Dr. King in either their school or their community. This year, we are honored to present this award to two deserving students. The first awardee, Dana Ayabara, a student in Richard Montgomery High School. Please come up to the stage, Dana. Dana was nominated by school counselor Bridget D. McCulvey for her contributions to MoCo Against Brutality, a student-led campaign to end police violence and reform the racist criminal justice system. Dana's work with the MoCo Against Brutality has raised awareness of the concerns of systemic racism among students. Her advocacy has raised awareness, increased education, and ignited a passion of racial justice among the students in our school and our community. <laughs> Ms. McKelvey said, Dana has demonstrated the courage necessary to speak up against systemic racism and violence and to encourage other students to do the same. Thank you, Dana for your continued efforts, courage, and advocacy to advance Dr. King's dreams within our community. Let's give one more round of applause for Dana. I am delighted to announce the second Martin Luther King Jr. Youth Awardee, Helen Mesfin, a student at Rockville High School. Helen, please join us on stage. <laughs> Helen was nominated by Dwayne Brown, College and Career Information Coordinator at Rockville High, for her work as President of the Minority Scholars. In this role, she works constantly to build bridges between students and school administration and the community. Under her leadership, MSP is responsible for igniting a very needed conversation and initiative on anti-racism. Mr. Brown said, Helen is an outstanding leader. She is a phenomenal communicator and advocate. She works extremely hard to ensure that all of those around her feel included and heard. Thank you, Helen, for creating an atmosphere of acceptance, advocacy, and communication. This is a true reflection of Dr. King's mission. I now have the honor of announcing this year's F. Michael Taff Award winner. 
The F. Michael Taff Award is awarded to an individual, organization, nonprofit employer, or business that has helped to improve the lives of people with disabilities in the city of Rockville through efforts to improve accessibility and raise public awareness. This year's awardee is Life, Living Independently for Everyone, Inc. And I'd like to invite Life representatives Paula Martin and Richard Moore to the stage. Life's mission is to assist individuals, their families, and caregivers through programs and services to empower all people with disabilities to have and make choices over their lives, to live self-sufficiently and interdependently with the proper support. To reach these goals, Life offers instruction, group meetings, support information and referrals, and resource, resource provisions in three core areas, including empowerment, access to cultural diversity in the arts, and employment. Thank you for all you do to improve the lives of people with disabilities in our community. You are truly making a difference. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning. Richard could not be here this morning, um, nor could Denise, the executive director. Uh, I'd like to read her words um, in her acceptance speech. Thank you. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the board of directors and executive director of Living Independently for Everyone, Inc., we would like to express our true gratitude for being chosen as one of the recipients of the F. Michael Tapp Award. It is humbling to be recognized for our efforts to improve accessibility and public awareness of persons with disabilities. To echo a quote from Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, sooner or later, all the people of the world will have to discover a way to live together in peace and thereby transform this pending cosmic elegy into a creative psalm of brotherhood. The founders of Life, Inc. were several individuals with various disabilities who had this same belief. From that belief, they created the mission of the organization. That mission is to provide programming and resources to assist individuals with various disabilities to live self-sufficient within their community to promote inclusion. We like to thank Mayor Newton and the residents of the city of Rockville for the acknowledgement and encouragement to continue to make strides in dissolving barriers and promoting equality for individuals with disabilities. Thank you, respectfully, Denise Thomas. All right, thank you again to all of our award recipients. All right, thank you for your patience. Let's give one more round of applause to all of our Martin Luther King Jr. Youth and Taft Award winners. 
Yes, truly amazing, truly amazing. So we are rounding out to the end of the event. Are y'all all right? Beautiful, we love to hear it. So I'd just like to uh, just take a moment to thank the city's Human Rights Commission and Rockville's mayor and council for hosting today's celebration, as well as our performers and keynote speaker. As we end today's celebration, let's remember today's theme, boldly imagining our future. Reflecting on the decades since the civil rights activism of the 20th century, we consider the work before us. Millennials and Gen Z have ushered in a new era of disruption and activism for racial, economic, social, gender, and disability justice, and I identify as an elder millennial, so yay us. Uh, so the next generation of activists is at the forefront of imagining and creating a more equitable, just, and inclusive world. As we move forward as a society, let's not forget these words from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Make a career of humanity. Commit yourself to the noble struggle for equal rights. You will make a better person of yourself, a greater nation of your country, and a finer world to live in. Thank you so much again for joining us for this celebration. Please join me in welcoming back Soul in Motion Drum and Dance Troupe for a closing performance. Again, my name is Unique Robinson. Thank you so much for having me. Peace.